Welcome to this session in our Classics Week for 2023. I will talk about keeping clean in Rome. And this front image, this image for the front slide, is Charles-Louis Clérisseau, view of the interior of an antique Roman bath, drawn around 1780. A very fine image, and doubtless it was like that. Indeed, it is very nice, isn't it? You've got this almost al fresco bathing experience, but with a nice vaulted ceiling. You can do that in the Mediterranean. I wouldn't try it in a country like England, certainly not in the north of England. Let's begin, though, and let's begin with ourselves, because all history is ultimately about ourselves. And we must classify as the cleanest generation ever. Look at all of this stuff here. It starts with you, pure impact shower gel. You've got something to keep your feet from getting smelly. You've got that rather interesting laser tooth whitening system, which may work. And when I looked at the advertisement, I thought, hmm, perhaps I should have a look at that. You then have this poster from the government of Pakistan. Let's have a look at it. Take a shower at least once a day. Hmm, I don't do that, but I feel half ashamed saying that I don't. Wear neat and clean clothes every day. Change your clothes when dirty or wet. Well, I do that because I get nagged into it, but... Keep your nails short and clean at all times. Wash your hands after going to the toilet, before and after eating, playing with animals, after brushing hair, and after playing outside. Well, of course, we all wash our hands after going to the toilet, don't we? And then brush your teeth at least twice a day after waking up in the morning and before going to bed at night. Oh, and wash your hair. Wash your hair often. Keep it neat and tidy by brushing and styling as often as you can. That's what the government of Pakistan encourages its people to do. And that's what most governments encourage. You must be clean. And on the whole, as I said, we are the cleanest generation in history. We are the cleanest and we are among the most body conscious. Look at the bottom left. You've got that rather interesting depilation machine. Rather a ferocious thing, but it's more efficient than shaving. You place it over the affected area, you grit your teeth and think of England, and you let it go buzz buzz. So that is what we do, or at least that's what we're expected to do. And indeed, on the whole, that is what we do. We are clean. We expect everybody else to be clean. And we look back at the past with horror and disgust. Look at this. There's a fine picture from the 17th century, a Dutch painting. An old woman at a window emptying a chamber pot. That's how it was. You do the business in your chamber pot at night, which you've kept under the bed. In the morning, you, or if you're lucky, one of your servants, will get rid of the contents, which means opening a window, leaning out, and perhaps hoping that you don't hit somebody passing by underneath. That was life in European cities in the 17th century. And here's a nice little article from the Morning Chronicle from the 9th of February 1778, talking about problems arising from the burial of the poor in the London graveyards. In some burial grounds near the centre of this city, the graves or pits for the reception of the lower sort of people are made sufficiently wide to contain four, five, or six wooden coffins abreast, and deep enough to hold twice as many in depth. These pits, after each burial, are covered with a few loose boards and a little mould to keep the coffin from common view. By which means these wholesale receptacles of the dead become so offensive as frequently to oblige the ministers and others upon funeral duty to stand at a considerable distance to avoid the horrid stench arising from them. Barely to mention the existence of a nuisance of this kind is sufficient to shock every man of reflection and humanity. 
and the testimonies of numerous writers confirm the insalubrity of such a practice, which may in a city like this produce the most fatal consequences. And this is from the 19th century, not from an earlier age. This is from the 19th century, an English doctor writing in 1801. Most men resident in London, and many ladies, though accustomed to wash their hands and faces daily, neglect washing their bodies from year to year. And as recently as 1884, a French committee. It must be admitted, first of all, that of all the civilised nations, ours is one of those which cares least about cleanliness. The most superficial inquiry is sufficient to prove that even among the well-to-do classes, strict bodily cleanliness does not always extend beyond the visible parts of the body. If we go back a little further, Elizabeth I took a bath once a month. She was considered rather cleanly in her habits. It was commented that she took a bath several times a year, whether or not she needed one. James I... Oh, he was a gross character. James I of England, VI of Scotland, never took a bath in his life. He had an absolute abhorrence of water. If he was expected to wash his hands before eating dinner, he would dip the tips of his fingers in the finger bowl put out for him, and that would count as his entire contribution to bodily hygiene. His lover, the Duke of Buckingham, wrote to him once in a semi-jocular letter asking for something and he said, I beseech your majesty, I kiss your dirty hands. James I, a disgusting man, he would never change his clothes. He once wore the same hat day after day for several years until it disintegrated. Then again, he didn't bother much with the toilet. If he went hunting, he would miss himself on horseback. He would just foul his clothes and then lie down waiting for his servants to cleanse him like a baby. Louis the Fourteenth took a bath three times in his life. Isabella of Spain took a bath twice in her life. And there's a story told by Catherine the Great of Russia. She came from a rather more cleanly part of Europe than Russia was in those days. And she noted that when she first had dinner, the men didn't take their hats off at the table. She thought at first it was a sign of disrespect. She then discovered that it was a sign of very great respect because the men's hair was so filled with lice that if they took their hats off, the vermin would drop onto the table. We rank ourselves beside people in the past. We look back with a shudder at the lack of hygiene in earlier generations. I will say more about this later. What I will say is that this view of the past as uniquely insanitary, as uniquely unhygienic, really is based on a view of European history during a few centuries. Most people throughout history have been a great deal cleaner than that. There were reasons for this lack of hygiene in early modern Europe. But, rightly or wrongly, we look back at previous centuries with a shudder. And then we look further back and we see the kindred spirits of the ancient world. They were much cleaner than people in later centuries. Have a look at this. This is a modern computer-generated image of Rome at its height. The largest city in the world, a million people at its height, it may have contained something like 1% of the world's entire population in about 100 AD. A vast city. And look at that great ceremonial centre. This represents a triumph. The Roman armies have been off, they've conquered some people, and now they're marching back into Rome, and the population has come out to celebrate and to greet the conquerors. There is another representation, and there is another one. These are quite nice images. You can do wonderful things with a computer.
I was given permission by the German company that produced these images to use them, and so I will use them. And they're very fine images too. All of these people, of course, were clean. They were as clean as we are. And if they're not quite as clean as we are, that's because they hadn't been got at yet by Colgate and Palmolive and all the other soap and tooth powder and toothpaste companies. But these people were clean in ways that people in the disgusting early modern period of Europe were not. You could go into those crowds and you didn't need to clamp a handkerchief soaked in perfume over your face to avoid the unpleasant bodily smells of the people standing beside you. And on the whole, that is an entirely correct view of matters, but there is another side to Roman cleanliness, and I will discuss that. So this is the other great age of human civilization that stands beside our own, or perhaps stands sort of above our own. The Mediterranean world has always had a certain interest in bodily cleanliness. Here are some representations of cleanliness among the Greeks. Bottom left, you've got young Greek men having baths or having washes, and on the right, you have young Greek women doing the same. You can see that these young men in the bottom left, they're standing or kneeling around a wooden tub filled with water, filled possibly with warm water. They're washing in the tub and you can see one of them emptying water over his friend's hair. So the Greeks took a great deal of care about their personal hygiene. They took a great deal of care about many things and again I'll come to that a bit later. But there is a fine representation of not having a bath but of keeping clean by washing and again if you lived in Athens you were expected to keep yourself clean if your body gave off offensive smells you might find that you didn't have as many friends as your somewhat more cleanly neighbors might as you move forward however as Rome grows and grows and becomes the mistress of the Mediterranean world, the Romans, who were themselves not uncleanly in their early history, take an increasingly ambitious view of bathing and they begin to build and maintain bathing establishments or theramai of great and increasing magnificence. Let's have a look at the great baths of Caracalla, or rather, let's begin by looking at the baths of Diocletian, opened, I believe, in the 290s AD. All of the Roman bathhouses are now in ruins, unfortunately, but the baths of Diocletian were only partially ruined in the 16th century, and Michelangelo came along looked at an area of the baths that had not been completely ruined, that still had its concrete vaulted roof, and he carved out of this a church. And this is the entrance hall to the Baths of Diocletian. This is not the Baths of Diocletian. This is the entry hall. I believe well, I'm sure, I have not the slightest doubt that that concrete vaulted roof is original to the Baths of Diocletian. I have good reason to believe that those marble columns are original, doubtless tarted up a bit by Michelangelo. The floor, I seem to remember that that is something that was relayed by Michelangelo, but this gives you an idea of the immensity and the magnificence of these baths and I would emphasize again that this is just the entrance hall to a much larger bathing complex. Unfortunately we can't see the baths of Caracalla as they were but I've given this image to stand in place of the baths of Caracalla. That gives you an idea of what going into these baths were like. It's not like walking into your local sports centre and shuffling past the reception desk in search of the swimming pool stroke tennis courts. This was a decidedly magnificent event 
in your daily life. But let's turn to the Baths of Caracalla. These were completed in or around 235 AD. The baths fill up an area of 300 acres. There are 6.9 million bricks, 252 interior columns, the height of the baths at their highest point, 100 feet, and the area of the main bathing complex, 1100 by 1050 feet. And although the baths were plundered at various times for building materials, it seems to have taken up 222,500 cubic feet of marble and granite to line the walls. These baths were not simply vast and magnificent in their appearance. They were also fitted with state-of-the-art Roman technology to regulate and contain the heat. They were fitted with glass windows, southwest-facing glass windows, so that not so much money needed to be spent on heating the water. Instead, the heat would be retained. These baths contained a promenade terrace, two large fountains. They contained a waterfall. There were libraries, there were shops, there were restaurants. There were, well, there was a brothel there as well, if that took your inclination. Everything that a civilised person or perhaps a not-so-civilised person could possibly want, you would get in those baths. The water, that was supplied by two aqueducts, and the water was stored in 18 lead cisterns, heated by 50 furnaces, burning about 10 tonnes of wood every day. And these baths were able to accommodate 8,000 people each day, or 1,500 people at a time. We're not entirely sure how many people they could accommodate, but they could take in large numbers of people. Depends, of course, how long you wanted to stay there. If you wanted to come in for a quick bath, you could be done in half an hour, maybe an hour. But most people would go there after lunch, and it would be a social occasion. You'd go to the baths as soon as work stopped, around three o'clock in the afternoon, and you'd stay there, lolling in the pool until a gong was sounded, telling you it's time to go home. So these are the Roman baths. You cannot just build these baths in isolation. There's no point saying, this is a large city, this is London in 1750, let's clean people up. Oh, I know what, let's build a copy of the Baths of Caracalla in Spitalfields or something. You can't do that because this kind of bathing complex, and there were many of these in Rome, this kind of bathing complex requires a great deal of infrastructure which itself may take several centuries to put in place. Let's have a look at the routine of bathing. I said you could have a bath in half an hour. You might take an hour or you might decide to, what did I say? You might decide to loll in one of the pools for several hours until closing time. And baths generally had this kind of layout. You had the apoditerium, which was a changing room. There were no lockers in the changing rooms because, well, there were no lockers. What you had was open niches. You would put your clothes in there, your clothes, your sandals. You would take off your fine outgoing clothes. And then, if you were wealthy enough, you would have a slave who would sit there talking with other slaves and he would protect your clothes from thieves. From the apoditerium, you'd proceed to the caldarium, a hot room, rather like a Turkish bath, a steam room. You would go into the steam room, or you'd go into the hot room, and you'd bake there for a while, and you'd sweat, and your pores would open, and all the dirt under your skin would come out, or at least be revealed to further inspection and attention. You would then jump into a tub of very hot water. It was possible to make the water too hot, and there are stories of people who 
accidentally drowned in the hot tubs or people who were murdered by being put into overheated baths. Indeed, the Emperor Constantine, the one who established Christianity, murdered one of his wives by shutting her into her own private baths and telling the furnace people, stoke that boiler up, she was baked to death in her own baths. However, we can assume that if you went into the Caldarium, you would come out alive. From the Caldarium, you'd move to the Tepidarium, the warm room, and you'd sit there for a while, acclimatising yourself to the next stage of your bathing experience. The last stage would be the Frigidarium, the cold pool to finish the bath by closing your pores. It was a cold pool purely relative to the other pools in the baths. It wouldn't be that cold. It might actually be warmer than the swimming pools to which we are accustomed. And that would be your bath. There was no reason why you had to go in that order. You'd have to start and finish in the apoditerium, of course. You would need to take your clothes off and put them on again. But which of the other three stages you took first was purely a matter of preference. But this seems to have been the average order in which people took their baths. No soap. Soap was available in the ancient world. It was rather a strong substance, best used for washing clothes. Instead of soap, you would use olive oil. You would take yourself into the caldarium, into the hot room. You would sweat all over. You would rub yourself with olive oil. And then you would scrape the olive oil off. With the olive oil, you would also scrape off all the sweat and dirt from your body. And once you'd scraped all that off, you would proceed to perhaps to the frigidarium to finish washing off the oil and to close your pores. That was the Roman experience of having a bath. And you could spend half the day in a bath. If you wanted to, you could spend the whole day in a bath. And you could do that every day if that took your inclination. Here's a long description of living near to a Roman bath written by Seneca the Younger. It is somewhat exaggerated, but this is about as good a description of the Roman bathing experience as we like to get. If you want to study, quiet is not nearly as necessary as you might think. Here I am, surrounded by all kinds of noise. You see, my lodgings overlook a bathhouse. Conjure up in your imagination all the sounds that make one hate one's ears. I hear the grunts of muscle men exercising and jerking those heavy weights around. They're working hard, or pretending to. I hear their sharp hissing when they release their pent breath. If there happens to be a lazy fellow content with a simple massage, I hear the slap of hand on shoulder. You can tell whether it's hitting a flat or a hollow. If a ball player comes up and starts calling out his score, I'm done for. Add to this the racket of a cocky bastard, a thief caught in the act, and a fellow who likes the sound of his own voice in the bath, plus those who plunge into the pool with a huge splash of water. Besides those who just have loud voices, imagine the skinny armpit hair plucker whose cries are shrill so as to draw people's attention and never stop except when he's doing his job and making someone else shriek for him. Now add the mingled cries of the drink peddler and the sellers of sausages, pastries and hot fare, each hawking his own wares with his own particular peel. Sounds rather nice, doesn't it? I said the Romans and the Greeks didn't use soap. Instead, they would cover themselves all over with olive oil, wait until this had blended with the sweat and the dirt on their bodies, they would then take one of these bronze instruments called a strigil, a bit like a blunt razor, a large blunt curved razor, like a sickle, I suppose, and you scrape your body down with this. Obviously, if we were to try that, we'd make a mess of it. But if you've been doing that since childhood, you can probably 
rub yourself down in a couple of minutes get the stuff off straight away take off the excess with a cloth and then go back to yourself that's how they did it no soap instead olive oil soap was known as an invention of the Gallic barbarians it was used for washing clothes but not so often used for washing bodies because it was rather a strong substance now let's turn to the water supply I said that you can't just build a gigantic bathhouse in the middle of a city you need this surrounding infrastructure and here we can talk about the Roman water supply. This is all rather conjectural because we don't have very good statistics from the Romans themselves. We also have great trouble trying to calculate how much water was lost during transit. The British water companies are notorious, not just for pushing our bills up sky high, but also for losing about half the water they claim to be pumping, and that is with modern building materials. A great deal of the water carried to Rome must have disappeared in transit, and of course a certain amount of it was stolen as well. But what we can say is that between about 300 BC and about 1 AD, the Roman population grew from about 50,000 to about 700,000 people. It may eventually have gone past a million. We're not quite sure of the population. There are estimates for the Roman population between about 300,000 and 1.5 million. I think 300,000 is a bit on the low side and 1.5 million may be pushing it. But 700,000 to a million sounds reasonable. Again, the statistics that we have from the ancient world are generally worthless. If a Greek or a Roman wanted to talk about the population of a city like Rome, he would pull a figure out of his head. This sounds a good one. 10 million people. 10 million people live in the city of Rome, he would say with the utmost assurance, as if he'd counted them personally but the Roman authorities didn't bother collecting statistics in the way that we do, so the Romans themselves didn't know how many people lived in Rome. We've worked out these statistics largely by looking at Chinese and Indian cities around 1900, before they were fitted with modern sewage systems, and looking at the density of population, other than that, we have a number of measurements the French government made of Paris in 1800. The French government very carefully counted the number of people in Paris. Because we know how big Paris was at the time, we can work out the number of people living within a certain number of square feet, and we can apply that to Rome with a bit of squinting, with a lot of squinting. But it was a very big population, and the local water supply was very soon inadequate to maintain that kind of population. Also, the main source of the main local source of water for Rome would be the River Tiber, and you can imagine that the Tiber would be rather smelly, rather polluted from all the sewage pumped into it or all the sewage dropped into it just as the Thames was notoriously a filthy river well into the 19th century until Baselgat oversaw the building of that wonderful sewage system in the 1860s and the Tiber was very polluted and you would then have pollution working its way through the soil towards all the springs and wells in and around Rome. So as the population grew, the local water supplies were inadequate to maintain a population of that size and also far too polluted. It was therefore necessary to bring large amounts of water in from far outside Rome. There is what we all recognise in the bottom left. There's an aqueduct, the Pont du Gard in France. The Romans built those all over the empire, and there were 11 of those. 
serving Rome itself. Some of them were still working in the late 19th century. There was one which never went completely out of operation. The popes in the 16th century, as the Roman population began to expand again, put a number of them back into operation. So these aqueducts have a very long history. These were made of concrete, covered in brick for the most part, and a great deal of skill went into building them. As I said, it's not just a matter of putting something up and saying the water can run down that. It's necessary to have a steady gradient for the flow of the water. If you have the gradient too steep, the water will rush down and it will strip the water channel of its waterproof concrete and you'll then need to keep maintaining it or it will just rip the aqueduct to pieces. If you have the gradient too shallow the water will start pooling and either it won't reach its destination or it will reach its destination after a very long stay in those channels and it will be rather spoiled. So it was necessary to have the water moving for perhaps 50 miles at a steady downward gradient. You have a drop of a regular 40 inches per mile. In the 14th century, many visitors to Rome had no idea what these things had been. They thought that they were a bit like motorway flyovers. Some people thought that these were roads along which people walked into Rome so they could get a nice view of the city. But in the 16th century, when the popes tried to have some of them put back into operation, it was then that the engineers realised that they didn't have the necessary skills to repair these aqueducts. And it was necessary for the engineers to spend several generations very carefully measuring and studying these things to see how it was done. But there were 11 of these serving Rome and the approximate measurements, which are very approximate because it depends on the speed of the water flow. It also depends on how much water is lost along the way. But these aqueducts together could carry about 400 million gallons of water every day into Rome. If you assume that the population of Rome was about a million, that's an easy calculation, 400 gallons per day per head of population. I looked up the relevant statistics for London in 2021 to 2022. The per capita consumption of water, that doesn't mean the amount of water supplied per head, but the per capita consumption of water in London last year was something like 31 gallons per day. I'm not comparing like with like. When I'm talking about 400 gallons per day per head in Rome, I'm talking about the amount of water available per head of population. If I'm talking about London last year, I'm talking about the amount of water consumed on average. But even so, you can see a considerable difference between the amount of water available for the Roman population and the amount of water available for the population of modern London. And in London, I don't think people are particularly sparing in their use of water, are they? Once the water had arrived in Rome, it was then distributed. It was divided roughly three ways. You've got water fed by pipes into the palaces of the rich and powerful, and the rich and powerful had plenty of water. You had about a third sent off to various industrial and agricultural purposes, and there was a great deal of market gardening around Rome and also inside the city. The city walls didn't just enclose a built-up area. There was always a great deal of agricultural land inside the city. The water came in very handy for that. The industrial uses, well, leather production, anything industrial needs water, doesn't it? So about a third of the water went off to those purposes. 
And then about a third went off to the fountains and the baths. Look at the image on the right. We mustn't assume that the Roman water supply was entirely a matter of aqueducts. Aqueducts are tremendously expensive to build and they're expensive to maintain. They were built where they were built. The reason the, the Pont du Gard was built was to carry the water across a valley. Mostly the water would come to Rome through canals. It was only where you had a sudden dip that you needed to build an aqueduct or sometimes the water we brought from a mountain source and then the idea would be to bring the water into Rome at quite a high level. So you'd bring the water into Rome by aqueduct so that you had the water pressure to distribute the water to the various places. Pumping was somewhat beyond the Romans. But as I said, those aqueducts were rather expensive an alternative was a siphon arrangement. Instead of building an aqueduct across a valley, what you'll do is you'll lay a pipe going down and going up, and the, the pull of the water further down the pipe will keep it moving. A siphon. You know what a siphon is. I can't describe it better than I have. There on the right is a siphon. This was built in the time of Claudius and it is in Turkey. Rather difficult to build siphons that go for more than a mile, but the Romans found a way of doing it. It involved blocks of marble which were very precisely carved so that when slotted into each other and closed with mortar, you had a completely airtight and, of course, watertight pipe, and then the water would rush down, rush up, and continue on its course. And the empire was crisscrossed by a network of canals, aqueducts, siphons, underground tunnels, all taking water, not just to Rome, but to all the other great cities of the empire. Rome was the giant city. It was by far the largest city in the Mediterranean world. But Alexandria was a city not very much smaller than Rome. If Rome had a population of a million, Alexandria had a population of about 700,000. There was Carthage, which had a population of about 500,000. There was also London, which may have had a population of somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 people. London probably didn't need that much attention given to its water supply because, as we're all aware, London has abundant rain and it also has the Thames flowing through it. And although a city of 200,000 people will make the Thames rather dirty. You can still bring water in from further upstream, but water supply was one of the main concerns of the Roman and the provincial governments, and the literature, the literary literature that survived, the books, and also the inscription literature surviving, does contain a great deal of material suggesting how much attention was given to the supply of water to the main urban centres. And without that kind of attention given to the water supply, there is no possibility of having those baths. Oh, there's a list of the main aqueducts built. You start in 312 BC with the Appian Aqueduct, you go down to 226, the Aqua Alexandrina, that appears to have been built to feed the baths of Caracalla. The middle one, the one built in 19 BC, the Aqua Virgo, that is the one that continued all through the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, and that was the main aqueduct that fed Rome and that was adequate for the Roman water supply until the 16th century. Because through the Middle Ages, the population of Rome 
was not a million, it wasn't 700,000, it was usually rather closer to about 30,000, and it didn't need that much water, but Rome had sufficient water. You then have the matter of heating the baths. And look at this for technology. I, I think we'll start by looking at the bottom right image. This is a hypercost, and I think this image is from a Roman villa in England. The Romans were rather good at central heating, and if you consider that the Mediterranean does get rather chilly in the winter, and once you move away from the Mediterranean, it's rather chilly most of the time, you can understand the attention that at least wealthy Romans paid to keeping warm. This is a nice representation of a Roman hypercost. What you have is a series of brick stacks. They're about two foot six high. Over those, you place a tiled floor, a tiled platform, let's say. Then on top of that, you lay a further slab of concrete about nine inches deep. And yes, the Romans did have concrete. They had very good concrete. Indeed, their concrete was, for many purposes, rather better than the concrete that we use. Now, the concrete was there for a number of purposes. One of them was to retain heat. The other one, well, I'll come to that. You have this void underneath the floor. You then have outside the building a furnace. And if you turn your attention to the top slide, which is defective in the functional sense, but it's useful for something. If you turn to the top slide, you can see a furnace. You can see a slave who is continually feeding this furnace with wood, sometimes with logs. But I believe that mostly the furnace was kept going with what we would regard as twigs. Sometimes with charcoal, sometimes with logs, sometimes with twigs. Whatever the case, you have the furnace going. The smoke and hot air then runs under the floor through this hypercost. It heats up the concrete and the concrete retains the heat for quite a long period. You then, and I don't have any representations of it, but then going up from the hypercost, you have the walls. And the walls are built from hollow bricks. The bricks have tubes inside them. So the hot air and the smoke run under the floor and then they expel themselves upwards, going through these channels built into the brick walls of the house, the outer brick walls, and that will keep the walls of the building warm as well. Modern central heating systems are rather primitive by comparison. What you have is hot water pumped around the house, and you've got a single or a double radiator. You can turn it up, you can turn it down, but if you're feeling rather chilly, the most you can do is move closer to the radiator. If you were a wealthy Roman, you had nothing as vulgar as a radiator. What you would do was you would walk around inside the large rooms of your villa. You wouldn't bother wearing shoes because your feet would be lovely and warm on those concrete floors. And of course they weren't concrete floors because the concrete slab would itself be covered with an elaborate mosaic or with marble tiles, something rather nice, something rather elegant and genteel. And it wasn't just a matter of keeping your feet warm. You would be warm all over because the heat radiated from every part of the room. It came up from the floor, it came out of the walls. And if you had tightly fitting glass windows, you could look out of the building and you could see how cold it was outside. One of the few compensations, I should imagine, if you were an official sent from somewhere like Ephesus to somewhere like Carlisle or Newcastle. I spent some time in the north of England. Indeed, I spent quite a lot of time in the north of England. But last year, we went off to the Scottish Highlands. We dropped by Newcastle. And 
we saw the north of England as it was in the winter. It's not the most pleasant experience, at least it's not the most pleasant experience coming from the Mediterranean world. You look out over these rain-sodden fields, you can't see very far because of the mist that's there, and you get that much of the year round. My wife rather likes it, and we might move there eventually, but you would need decent central heating in such a house. And this was one of the compensations for living in the north of Roman Britain. And as I said, the Mediterranean is not always sparkling sea and bright golden sun. The Mediterranean world gets rather chilly in the winter, and so you had these. But coming to the baths, the baths would have this underfloor heating and they'd have the wall heating and in the hot rooms it would be made very very hot you also had the heating of the pools and this top image i've said that it's functionally defective in the sense that you can't see any means for the hot water to replace the cooler water in the pool so you'll need to use your imagination as well and to supply further pipes my understanding though is that the furnaces would not just push smoke and hot air under the floors they would also heat the water tanks and the water tanks would keep the pools at the right temperature through some kind of convection flow of water the cooler water would flow out through the bottom back into the hot tank the hot water from the hot tank would be pushed out into the pool and so you would have a circulation of water between the pool and the hot tank which would keep the pool at whatever temperature you wanted before i move on i'll add the further use of this concrete slab one of the downsides of this hypercourse system was that underneath the floor you would not just have hot air moving about you'd have smoke you'd have poisonous carbon monoxide gas if there was a hole in your concrete floor or if there was a defect in the channels through the brick walls you would get a seepage of carbon monoxide into the living or the sleeping areas i'm not aware of people who died from carbon monoxide poisoning in the roman world but i've no doubt it happened there's any number of accounts from victorian england of people who died because of the variable flow of gas so you'd go to bed with your gas light turned down the gaslight would then go out and the room would fill up with poisonous coal gas. Carbon monoxide poisoning must have been an ever-present danger in wealthy private homes and in the baths indeed. Not the safest way of heating water and air, but it did keep the baths nicely warm. Here's another representation of the Baths of Caracalla, and this is a nice one showing the flow of water through a complex. There on the far left you've got the aqueduct, which we think supplied a water flow of 15 gallons a second. The water entered these huge holding tanks, two of them here. The water entered the holding tanks for a number of reasons. One was to hold it. The other thing was to make sure that any impurities in the water, any grit, would settle before it moved on into the baths. When you want to, you open the gates and water rushes down through these great conduits, these great pipes. And the Romans built these pipes very large. They were big enough for a man to walk around upright. The reason for that was that the water in central Italy is rather hard and you get build-ups of calcium inside aqueducts, inside pipes. 
every so often you need to send teams of men into those pipes or into those aqueduct channels to chip out the calcium deposits to keep these things clean for the water to flow through. So the water comes down this great conduit and it passes into the baths where you have 50 brick furnaces burning to keep the water at a consistent temperature. The water enters the main hot pool, something the size of an Olympic swimming pool, which can hold 1,500 bathers at a time. It's kept hot, it's kept very hot. You can have a more elaborate system where the water is continually exchanged between a hot tank and the bath, the system I tried to describe just now. The water then moves on under the floors, keeping the rest of the bathing complex rather warm or perhaps even hot. It then passes outside into that open air swimming pool. So the swimming pool itself, even in an Italian summer, was kept hot by these furnaces. And to repeat, you had 50 brick furnaces consuming 10 tons of wood every day. The water then continues down this waste pipe into a drain from where it proceeds into the main sewers to keep those flushed out and from there it proceeds into the River Tiber. And on Tuesday, we read that rather distressing story of the two bathhouse slaves who wanted to escape. Working underground in the baths of Caracalla, keeping these 50 furnaces burning, keeping them supplied with wood, was not the most pleasant of jobs. It was dark, it was hot. The slaves, well, slaves were slaves, one of the blots on the history of the ancient world. Two slaves, they want to escape. The best way to escape is down this escape tunnel for the water. As I said, it's a big tunnel. You can get several men walking side by side down it. Their plan was to open the escape gate and then to hurry down the tunnel, get into the river, and from there they could get away to freedom, lose themselves in this vast city of a million people, where you can remake yourself in ways so that nobody can ever recognise you as an escaped bathhouse slave. Going back from this, going back to the arrangement, I don't believe that it was a continuous flow of water from the aqueduct down to the River Tiber. My understanding is that these holding systems, they would fill up to the top, the excess water would be piped off into people's houses or for other uses. Most of the time, these great bronze gates would be shut and water would not be coming from the system into the baths. Instead, the baths would be filled up with water, it would be kept hot until it was time to change the water. As I said, some kind of convection flow of water between the pool, the heating tank and back into the pool and then along into the heated swimming pool. But the water was kept hot for as long as was thought desirable. And only then were the various gates opened and all of the used water would then flow out and down those conduits, flushing out the sewers and emptying into the Tiber. And then fresh water would be brought down into the baths. It would be uneconomical to have a continuous flow of water because burning 10 tons of wood every day is expensive. I wanted to say wood doesn't grow on trees, but it does. But even so, it is rather expensive. And so you would hold the hot water in the baths for a while. And I will come back to that because there is much more to be said about these baths, much more to be said. So that is an approximate diagrammatic representation of the baths of Caracalla, the largest of all the Roman bathing complexes. Oh, 
before I move on, two miles of tunnels underneath. I don't know what these tunnels are used for. Obviously, there'd be storage rooms for wood and for other things, but it again, it wasn't just a building with some depressions filled with water. People would jump into the water, have their bath and go away again. It involved a great deal of very clever technology, which we are even now still rediscovering. Let's look at the organization of these baths. And, oh, there's an Alma Tadema painting. Not his best. I don't think Alma Tadema has done the best job of representing human flesh as seen through water. Or perhaps he's done a very good job. Perhaps the idea was to represent as much human flesh as he could. Anyway, there were two kinds of bathing establishment. There were the state baths, things like the baths of Diocletian, the baths of Caracalla, etc. And there were 11 of those in Rome. You then had a round, and the numbers that we have are taken from various times across about four centuries. So the number must have gone up and down at various times. But at one point, there were 11 thermi, that's large bathing complexes, and 856 balnea, which are private bathhouses. And these private bathhouses would have ranged in size and amenity all the way from something like miniature reproductions of the state thermi, all the way down to buildings fitted out with 10 or 20 bathtubs. And the cleanliness and the general amenity of these baths would depend on what the owners wanted to supply and what the customers wanted to buy. The private baths, those were run for profit and they attracted specific kinds of clientele. So I suppose if you're a poet, you might go to a bathhouse much frequented by poets. Rather like coffee houses in 18th century London. If you were interested, you could go to a coffee house frequented by sailors from the Far East, or you could go to a coffee house frequented by dandies, or coffee houses frequented by Whigs and Tories, coffee houses for ladies, that sort of thing. That's how the Roman baths would have been. The state establishments, these were what we would nowadays call public private partnerships. The state would build these things. They would then be contracted out to private organizations, which would pay a fixed rent to the state. The contract would involve repairing and insuring, rather like with modern commercial leases. So these contractors would supply money up front to the state, and in return for that, they would have the right to charge entry to the baths for a certain term, usually, I think, seven years. The standard charging to get into those baths was very small. It was usually the smallest circulating coin. Almost anybody could afford to go to the baths. If you were a day labourer in Rome, you and your family would not be able to go to the baths every day and spend hours wallowing in one of those pools. You would certainly be able to go once a week. So everybody had the opportunity to be clean at least once a week. And let's face it, that is clean most of the time, isn't it? The baths would open at noon and then they would continue until dusk, the opening and closing indicated by a gong. If you were a rich man and you wanted to court favour with the people, you would go to one of the contractors and you'd supply the contractor with a sum of money. And then the baths would be thrown open to all comers for free. No doubt there'd be big notices put up. These baths are running free during the month of June because of the very generous gift of Junius Bassus and make sure that when you see him in the race course or in the arena that you give him a big round of applause to show the emperor how much you love him or something. But rich people, 
would often stand in as benefactors to the public by paying for the baths to be thrown open to the people free of charge. And as I said, there were so many bathhouses, not just in Rome, there were so many bathhouses in all the cities of the empire, and entrance was usually so cheap and was often free that everybody had the opportunity to go once a week, twice a week, several times a month, whatever, and to take advantage of those baths. So it's not the case that these were the preserve of the upper classes. They were certainly not. They were open to all. Indeed, the baths were not just places where you went to get clean. They were part of your daily life. And it was here that you would often mix with the lower classes. Let's have a look at some of these descriptions which are taken from the various lives of the emperors. Suetonius, life of Titus. Titus was the emperor between 79 and 81 AD. So as not to pass up any opportunity of courting popular favour, Titus sometimes bathed in the baths which he had built in company with the common people. Commodus, he was emperor between 192 and I think 217 AD. Commodus used to bathe seven and eight times a day and was in the habit of eating while in the baths. You then have this rather strange story of the Emperor Hadrian, 117 to 138 AD. Hadrian often bathed in the public baths, even with the meanest crowd, and a jest of his made in the bath became famous, for on a certain occasion, seeing a veteran whom he had known in the service, rubbing his back and the rest of his body against the wall, he asked him why he had the marble rub him, and when the man replied that it was because he did not own a slave, the emperor presented him with some slaves and the cost of their maintenance. But another time, when he saw a number of old men rubbing themselves against the wall for the purpose of arousing the equal generosity of the emperor, he ordered them to be called out and then to rub one another in turn. There it is. The baths are a place of popular resort where the upper and the lower classes will mingle on terms of reasonable equality, not complete equality, but reasonable equality. Then we have this story from Commodus, emperor from 180 to 191. Rather unpleasant man. For when it happened that his bath was drawn too cool, Commodus ordered the bath keeper to be cast into the furnace, whereupon the slave who had been ordered to do this burned a sheepskin in the furnace in order to make him believe by the stench of the vapour that the punishment had been carried out. That's an interesting story. It tells you something about the movement of air between the furnaces and the bathing areas. So perhaps it was not always completely safe. But that will do for social bathing. Mixed bathing... That's something that always arouses a certain frisson in the modern world. There's no doubt that the Romans bathed naked. Anyone who claims that they had special bathing costumes is having you on. Here's one of Marshall's epigrams. If you hear clapping of hands in the bathing hall, Flaccus, you may be sure of some deformed person's enormous member there. If somebody particularly well endowed turned up in the baths, everyone would give him a round of applause. That's all the evidence you need for nude bathing. That image is a still from a Japanese film made in 2012. I haven't seen the film. I might do, but apparently it's a light comedy. Strange people, the Japanese, their idea of light comedy may be different from ours. There is... No doubt that during the Republican period, down to the time of Augustus, men and women bathed separately. There were different bathing rooms for the men and women. But you then have a long series of notices in the imperial biographies that men and women bathed together. Marcus Aurelius abolished common baths for both sexes. 
Alexander, Alexander Severus, forbade the maintenance in Rome of baths used by both sexes, which had indeed been forbidden previously, but had been allowed by Elar Gabalus. I'll say more about him in a minute. Mixed bathing appears to be in the norm. Even the church fathers, when they condemned proceedings in the baths, were rather moderate in their denunciations of mixed bathing. They simply said that you should not look too lustfully on the naked women in the baths. Sex and drinking in the baths. People did eat in the baths. You would spend a lot of your day there and you would use the baths as a social meeting place. And there is no doubt that there were brothels in the baths. And here you have a number of graffiti and a number of stories. Here's a graffito from the baths of Herculaneum. Two companions were here. And since they had a thoroughly terrible attendant called Epaphroditus, threw him onto the street not a moment too soon. They then spent 105.5 sesterces, most agreeably while they fucked each other or prostitutes. Apelles, Chamberlain of the Emperor and Dexter, had lunch here most pleasantly and fucked at the same time. Sex in the baths was not unknown, it wasn't illegal, and... There are a number of rooms in the ruined baths which seem to have been private rooms which may have been rented out for the uses of this kind. Or Heliogabalus, that rather strange young man in the picture, he was the strangest or perhaps just the most debauched of all the emperors. I won't say much about him. Well, actually I will. He made a public bath in the imperial palace and at the same time threw open the baths of Plautinus to the populace that by this means he might get a supply of men with unusually large organs. It's not just a matter of bathing. You have a further imperative, a very important imperative for the Romans and the Greeks as well. I've no doubt that not all the Greeks and Romans looked exactly like this, but this was the ideal. Notice, it doesn't matter if you've got a great big beard on your face, you don't want to have a hairy chest, you don't want hairy armpits, and you don't want hairy legs. And that's not just men, but it's also women. But it is particularly the case with men, since they did spend somewhat more of their lives than we do, naked in public. You want to show yourself to your best effect. Have a look at these willies. I did once think nothing much of these. I just thought that's the artist's attempt at representing pubic hair. And the reason on the left he's not representing pubic hair is he wants to give an idea that this particular person or this particular god is prepubescent, though this particular person on the left is probably not prepubescent. However, it is very much the case that just as we have particular hairstyles to show off, so the Greeks and the Romans, when they showed themselves naked in public, would pay a great deal of attention to their body hair, to its shaping and indeed its removal. Shaving and depilation. The ancients spent a lot of time shaving and depilating themselves. And let's start with English heritage on the far right. There's a representation of various Roman tweezers dug up in London. Oh, these were from Roxeter. At Roxeter alone, we have discovered over 50 pairs of tweezers, one of the largest collections of this item in Britain, indicating that it was a popular accessory. The advantage of the tweezer was that it was safe, simple and cheap, but unfortunately not pain-free. It may come as a surprise to some that in Roman Britain, the removal of body hair was as common with men as it was with women. Doesn't surprise me at all, but there are the tweezers. But, well, tweezers... They're not very efficient, are they? Especially if you've got quite a large amount of body hair. So let's see what the Romans did with their body hair. Suetonius, life of Julius Caesar. He took too much care of his appearance. 
to the point of not only having his beard removed with nippers and shaved with a razor, but even of being depilated, for which things he was blamed. Or Augustus. We always, you're supposed to think of Augustus as a rather conservative, respectable kind of Roman, but no. Augustus was in the habit of singeing his legs with burning nutshells to make the hair grow more silky. At least he had hair on his legs. Then you have Galba, one of the unfortunate three emperors from 68 and 69 AD. Galba was around 70 when he was proclaimed emperor. They say that when Achaelus, one of his old-time favourites, brought him news in Spain of Nero's death, he not only received him openly with the fondest kisses, but begged him to depilate himself without delay and took him aside for sex. There you go. And then we come back to Heliogabalus. In the public baths, Heliogabalus always bathed with the women, and he even treated them himself with a depilatory ointment, which he applied also to his own beard. And shameful though it be to say it, in the same place where the women were treated, and at the same hour, he shaved groins of his male lovers using the razor with his own hand, with which he would then shave his beard. Life of Heliogabalus. A rather strange young man was Heliogabalus, but... We're talking about the baths, not about the private lives of the more grotesque emperors. Domitian. It was rumoured that Domitian was fond of depilating his concubines himself and would bathe them in a crowd of the most infamous whores. There is a picture of Theseus from Herculaneum. He has slain the Minotaur and he's surrounded by the very grateful seven boys and seven girls who've accompanied him from Athens. They're very grateful that they're no longer likely to be pushed one at a time into the labyrinths to be torn apart and eaten by the Minotaur. And notice that Theseus, or the model for the painting, has taken a great deal of care with the matter of bodily grooming. So... The Romans did not simply bathe a lot. They were also concerned with the removal of body hair. And let's have a look at the methods. Oh, there we are. There's a representation of a woman getting herself depilated in Athens. For those of you who are not aware of the ways of waxing, there is a representation from a beauty salon in London. They didn't use tweezers for depilation. Well, they did use tweezers, but it's not the most efficient way of getting the hair off. The simplest depilation wax is the one called pitch plaster. Dry pitch is diluted with oil. It is applied hot to the skin, which must first be cleanly shaved. Under which circumstances, it appears closely. Before the plaster is quite cold, it is taken off, warmed again, and put on afresh. Again, it is removed before being cold, and this process is repeated several times. Now, if you've ever waxed, or if you've ever seen waxing, that's something with which you'll be perfectly familiar. The removal of hair was an important part of the cleanliness ritual among both the Greeks and the Romans. And there's a quote from Aristophanes. Oh, I'll read it to you. If we were to go naked with a smooth pubis, our husband's cocks would stand, and they would be desperate to have us. Something said on the Athenian stage to a thoroughly delighted crowd, probably rolling in the aisles. Now, what did the Christians think of bathing? Bear in mind that bathing was generally in the nude, and bear in mind that it was mixed bathing, and bearing in mind that all sorts of other things went on in the baths as well, you would expect that the church fathers would not have been entirely friendly to the custom of bathing. And not all of them were. Clement of Alexandria, 2nd century, the baths are open promiscuously to men and women, and there they strip for licentious indulgence, for from looking men get to loving as if their modesty had been washed away in the bath. And St. Jerome, the man who translated the Bible into Latin, 
Is your skin rough and scaly because you no longer bathe? He that is once washed in Christ needs not to wash again. But although there were Christians who were hostile to public bathing, they seem to have been the minority. Most Christians seem to have carried on much the same as before their conversion, and going to the baths was a daily ritual so ingrained in the life of the Mediterranean that it would have been very unusual for them to stop going. Indeed, here we have mention of a bishop Sicinius. He was also accustomed to indulge himself by wearing white garments and bathing twice a day in the public baths. And when some asked him why he a bishop bathed himself twice a day, he replied, because it is inconvenient to bathe three times. You have St John Chrysostom giving one of his sermons in Constantinople, in which he says, as an aside, that there's nothing at all unusual to see monks and bishops and priests and nuns walking around stark naked in the public baths. Nothing wrong with that at all. Indeed, it reminds us of the fact that we're born naked, and if we put on fine clothes, if we're rich enough, under those clothes, we're all equal. So you have mixed views of bathing among the Christians, most of them appear to have carried on bathing in exactly the same way as the pagans, probably not going to the brothels afterwards, at least one might hope so, but bathing in exactly the same way, strip off naked, run around in the baths, and go home clean. Then you have the more ascetic Christians. Oh, there's a representation on the right of St. Simeon Stylites, he lived for 37 years on top of a 40-foot column, every so often shouting down advice and predictions to people who came to hear what he had to say to them. I don't believe he washed very often. Indeed, I'm told that he once stood on one leg for several months, and when his leg turned a bit gangrenous from the lack of motion, he told his disciple Anthony to put the maggots that dropped out of his wounds back into his flesh because God had placed them there and they should not be denied the sustenance they had been promised. So you have a mixed view of bathing among the Christians. Most of them, I would emphasize, carried on bathing exactly as before because no one felt any sense of shame at bathing naked even in front of members of the opposite sex. Oh, there's a home bath. Not many of those, so I won't say much about that. Let's look at the toilets now. Here's some statistics. The average person excretes four ounces of solids per day, so I'm told. I'm sure some people do more than that. Assume a Roman population of about a million people. That gives you £250,000 of excrement to remove from the city of Rome. Most people didn't have toilets. The wealthy had toilets. They had flush toilets. But most people used chamber pots. These were emptied into the street. And it was rather like early modern Europe in that respect. There was a large sewer system. But there was no venting, and you did have frequent explosions from accumulations of hydrogen sulphide and from methane. These toilets went into the Tiber, and you can look at the downside of the Roman toilets, but there is a Roman toilet. This is from a communal latrine at Halstead's Roman Fort in the north of England. The Romans felt no shame about walking round naked in the baths or in many other places, and they felt no shame about communal lavatories. I think most of us would be... We might feel a certain constraint if we walked into a toilet and found that arrangement, but, as I said, in the past, people were much less modest. Indeed, in Hampton Court... Henry VIII had the great house of easement built where 30 or 40 people could sit together on the lavatories, which had velvet toilet seats. So the long history behind here. That's going to the toilet, if you're an ordinary person. 
There is an emperor's toilet. It's made of porphyry, a super hard kind of granite that is purple. Its use was reserved for the emperor and for members of the imperial family. Now this was a lavatory, it was a toilet seat made for an emperor. It stuck around in Rome. It's still there in the Vatican Museum. Another one got taken off by Napoleon to the Louvre in about 1800. But this particular seat was used in papal coronations until 1560. And I'm not entirely sure about the truth of this story. I think we all know the, the semi-mythical or the entirely mythical story of Pope Joan, a woman who got herself made Pope in the early Middle Ages, causing great scandal. There's no reason to suppose that she did exist, but never mind. Apparently, until 1560, as part of the coronation ceremony, it was necessary for the Pope to pull up his robes and sit on this chair, and then a deacon would look underneath if the deacon saw what he expected to see, he would stand up and say in the presence of the cardinals, testiculos habet et bene pendentes. He has testicles and they dangle well. Is this the truth or is it some piece of rather inventive propaganda put out by the Protestants? Hard to say, but Pius V stopped using it in 1560 and it was then moved to the Vatican Museum where it's been ever since. But that is a Roman emperor's toilet seat. The emperor himself would sit on that, perhaps with a bucket underneath, or perhaps with some kind of arrangement underneath by which things were conveyed far away from his presence. What about wiping? Didn't have toilet paper in the ancient world. There seem to have been two main ways of wiping. There is what is called a tersorium, a sponge on a stick. Do I need to describe its use? It was kept in a vat of seawater or of vinegar between uses. You would use it, put it back into its container and leave it there for somebody else to use. If you go back to look at the arrangement of these Roman toilets, they've got those openings in the front. That, apparently, is so that you could be sitting there and you could use your sponge on a stick. If you were caught out away from a public toilet, you would use a pissoy. That is a piece of broken pottery. And there on the right is a representation of somebody using one of these pissoy. I read about this in the British Medical Journal some years ago, and there was the terse comment that this can't have been good for hemorrhoids. There were all the other usual ways of wiping. I believe the Romans and the Greeks, rather like some Indians, they would use their left hands to cleanse themselves and then wash their hands afterwards. Or you would use moss, or you would use something but they didn't have Andrex to ply. We know that much for sure. That is bottom wiping. The Romans bathed and they had toilets. Did these make them healthy? And I'd like to say, yes, it made the Romans super healthy. They were so much healthier than people in the Middle Ages and so much healthier than those people in London and Paris who 200 years ago would wash their hands and faces, but they wouldn't touch any other part of their body with water from one year's end to the next. But there is absolutely no evidence that all this attention to cleanliness made the ancients particularly healthy. Look at this, the bottom box on this slide. Overall life expectancy. This is what we believe was the case in the Mediterranean world in Roman times and it's extrapolated from some figures collected in China at the beginning of the 20th century. Your life expectancy at birth is 22 years. 75% of children survive the first year. At age one, your life expectancy is 36 years, and if you make it to 10, your life expectancy is 47 years. 
there's a big spread between social classes. It's always been the case, it seems, that the rich have lived on average 10 years longer than the poor, sometimes rather more than 10 years longer. If you were a field slave or a slave working in one of those mines or quarries, you'd be worked to death and your death would happen in your late 20s. If you were rich, you might make it into your 50s before an infection carried you off, but life expectancy was not wonderful. It certainly doesn't compare with what we expect. The problem with all this Roman attention to cleanliness was that the Romans had no understanding of the germ theory of disease. By looking at Roman toilets, by digging around in them and analysing the remains from under those toilets, what we can find is that the Romans were infested with intestinal worms, lice and fleas, omnipresent ticks and a number of combs have been found. It seems that part of your daily grooming ritual would involve combing the nits out of your hair. Not surprising that the ancients spent so much time depilating their bodies. That was one way to keep the lice under control. If you go back to that schematic diagram I showed you of the baths of Caracalla, you'll see that the water did not wash continuously through between the aqueduct and the river Tiber. It was held in those pools for a while, and sometimes it was held for a very long while. It seems that the water was changed only when it turned visibly brown, and when it was covered with oil from people's bodies and with cosmetics. And so the water was decidedly unclean. And if you've ever had a Veruca, you'll know that swimming pools, even nowadays, are not entirely hygienic. And you see modern swimming pools are dosed with hydrogen peroxide. You've got micro mesh filters. You've got pumps which maintain a continuous circulation of water through those filters. And with all that, you can still pick up some unpleasant conditions in the swimming pools and Verucas are the least of it. Have a look at some of these casual writings by Roman doctors and other people. Celsus, a second century doctor. One of the worst things to do for a fresh wound that has not been fully cleaned is to go to the baths, for this renders the wound both wet and dirty and frequent results in gangrene. That tells you something about the quality of the water into which a wounded person might plunge his extremities. But the fact of going to the baths with an open wound tells you something about what goes into the water. Or Scribonius Largus writing in the second century, who recommends a particular kind of bandage which has the great advantage of not dropping off in the public baths, which tells you that many people who are wearing bandages would go to the public baths and the bandages would drop off, exposing whatever was underneath to the water. Or another little episode from the home life of Heliogabalus. Once during a private conversation, the question arose as to how many men with hernias were in the city of Rome, and he knew Gabalus thereupon issued an order that all should be noted and brought to his baths, and then he bathed with them, some of them being men of distinction. Nothing wrong with hernias, I suppose, but... Look at Hadrian. None but invalids were allowed by Hadrian to bathe in the public baths before the eighth hour of the day. Invalids, not just people who walk around with a limp or have a hernia, but I suppose people with great open weeping sores allowed into the baths. Then, after the eighth hour, they'd all be cleared out, and the baths would be there, ready and waiting for other people to go in. It does seem that the practice of bathing in public was a very good way of picking up all sorts of unpleasant skin diseases and all sorts of other deeply unpleasant conditions. When people began to look 
at the actual cleanliness of the Greeks and Romans, they were surprised, they were shocked. They were shocked because they expected that the ancients would be so much healthier than people in the Middle Ages or in early modern Europe. It turns out that quite often they were less healthy. They didn't smell as bad, they looked clean, but those baths were not places into which you or I would willingly set foot. We then come to the Middle Ages. It is not the case that as soon as the Western Empire fell, bathing went out of fashion and you then had a thousand or fifteen hundred years of omnipresent dirt and smell until the soap companies got hold of us in the early 20th century and began nagging us to have showers once a day. Bathing continued all through the Middle Ages and here is a nice 15th century representation of public baths. You can see people sitting together in the bathtubs. They're having a very good time and I've no doubt that later on they'll have an even better time and you have a young man entertaining them on the left. The baths continued. People were not quite as clean in the Middle Ages as in Roman times because the infrastructure of the water supply wasn't up to it. But people did bathe as often as they could and some people would bathe every day. The reason we became so notoriously, so grossly filthy between about 1550 and 1850 in Europe, not elsewhere in the world, was because the doctors got it into their heads that hot water was unhealthy and therefore the doctors recommended that people should keep away from baths, certainly from hot baths, and that they should even, they shouldn't risk their health by putting too much water onto their skin. They should wash their faces and hands and that was it. Part of the reason for this was the outbreak of syphilis. The first outbreaks of syphilis in the 1490s. This was much more virulent, it was much nastier. I won't trouble you with the descriptions of it, but it was a much nastier disease at its first onset than it later became. It was communicated through these public baths and it was a matter of public health when in the 1520s the government of Henry VIII in England and governments all throughout Europe closed all the public baths and then you get into the late 16th century, the 17th century, the time of Louis XIV and James I and then we come into the late 18th, early 19th centuries where people didn't wash much. That was an episode in European history. Mostly we have tried to keep clean we haven't always tried with as much obsessiveness as our own generation does, or with the same devotion to cleanliness as the Greeks and Romans. But keeping clean, to some degree, has been part of the human condition for as long as we have been human beings. But although I could say much more about this, we're running out of time. But at least I think I've covered everything and there is a bibliography. I've sent you my email address so if you want to see these slides I'll gladly send them out to you as a PDF. Do send me an email if you want these slides. As I said I'll turn them to a PDF and I'll send them out pretty sharpish. Let me give you my email address and by the way if anybody has any questions or comments don't hold back.